page 59, you mentioned the Vatican II. The Second Vatican Council is perhaps the key moment in the shift in the Church's self-understanding from the creator and protector of Christendom to a scattered leaven in a secular world. So would you say that Vatican II is the Council of Exile? I would say Vatican I and Vatican II are the councils of exile. Prior to 1870, the Catholic Church in general, the magisterium, you know, the, the curia in the Vatican could count on Catholic rulers to basically implement the teachings of the church with regard to doctrine and morals. Uh, not perfectly, radically flawed, in fact, down through the ages. But when you look at 1789, the period for the French Revolution, you know, you, you have the eldest daughter of the church turning on the mother. But even before that, you have in the Reformation. So in the early 16th century, not just Luther in Germany and Calvin in Geneva, Switzerland, but across most of Northern Europe, you have Protestantism turning on mother church and the spiritual father of the Pope. You know, in my own lectures and my courses, I trace this back to Machiavelli. I trace this back to Occam. I trace this back to Marsilius of Padua to show that, I mean, already in the 1300s, you have the seeds that are sown that become these weeds that choke off the fruit of Christendom. Uh, and so Vatican I can no longer count on Christian Catholic rulers to implement these things. And so the infallibility of the Pope in a certain sense, becomes necessary and fitting precisely because who else can Catholics turn to now that all of their rulers have basically turned their back on the faith? Vatican II, I would say, is the full flowering of this, uh, you know, because you have more bishops at Vatican II from the third world, outside of what Europe had been as Christendom. You know, uh, and so... I, I want to be careful here because I think what you find in Dignitatis Humanae, at least what I found when I first read it as a Protestant, is the traditional teaching of the church, which is renewed in the catechism, that not just human individuals, not just families, but societies, rulers, have an obligation to render worship to God in truth, not just kind of following their own way. And so while we respect consciences, we recognize that just following your conscience is not enough. You've got to form your conscience according to the infallible truth of the Catholic faith because the holy sacrifice of the Mass is the most perfect and proper form of worship for citizens and societies. And so you can find that in Vatican II, but you can't find that in the world today. And so I suspect that the Holy Spirit had a purpose in giving people the pastoral counsel that they would need in order to live in societies now that are not only post-Christian, but profoundly anti-Christian. You mentioned um, Stefan Vajinsky. Uh, that was a great uh, part of the book I really loved. Um, but in the time we have left, I wanted to ask you about um, part later on in the book where you talk, you mention in passing the liturgical debates and and as we all should, you lament that it's sort of a, a locus of rancor. And what would you like to, uh, can you summarize some of the things you said in the book about what would you like to inject into that liturgical debate to bring it towards some positive fruit? Well, I mean, I have an aversion to liturgical politics, but I have an attraction to the traditional Latin mass. And I, I, I don't hide it, but I also don't put it on parade. And Brandon, oh, I hope I'm not telling tales out of school. I mean, he's at most precious blood. He, he drives his family a little bit, a little longer. And the place is just exploding with young families with lots of kids and reverence, too. That's the yeah. FSSP parish. That's in right, Pittsburgh. in Pittsburgh. Yeah. You know, and our parish, uh, St. Peter's, downtown Steubenville, has the traditional Latin mass with Father Tim every Sunday at noon. And invariably, I'm drawn to that, not because I just feel so at home. I mean, the Novus Ordo is more like home to me, you know, like marriage is so much more natural to me. But that doesn't mean holy orders is inferior or even on the same level. Holy matrimony, holy orders, they really, one hand washes the other. I would say that the Novus Ordo, done well, I mean, it, it's a valid mass, and so it brings heaven to earth. And so I just don't wade into those waters much anymore because I just don't find it to be productive, especially at this time. 
And so as long as we have that sort of freedom, let's be honest and acknowledge the fact that the reverence, the transcendence, the beauty, even if it does feel at times somewhat alien to our own cultural conditioning, nevertheless, it points us to something that shows us that what we have in the visions of John and the Apocalypse are visions of heavenly worship that leave, I mean, John falls on his face as though dead. And Jesus doesn't say, come on, John, you're my beloved disciple, get up. Fear not, you know. There is a sense in which their healthy awe, reverence, and fear makes us want to plant our faces before the Almighty God. I could go on, but let me let me just say this, that either way, you know, the, the Western right in both forms has this capacity that is still largely untapped. In fact, I think it's unrecognized. The Catholic faith in general and the, the holy sacrifice of the Mass in particular has a power to form civilizations the likes of which no other religion can boast. It just can, and it has. The second thought, though, is this, that the primary purpose of the Catholic faith and the holy sacrifice of the Mass is not to form Catholic civilizations. It's to form saints. And so if we seek first the kingdom of heaven, these things might be added, but invariably we start seeking these things instead, and we also check off that box, you know. But you can't have the tail wag the dog. And so this is what causes things to crumble. But because the the Catholic faith and the holy sacrifice of the Mass can form saints, and really nothing else can or does, you can also sense why it is that the Catholic Church and the sacrifice of the Mass forms opposition, forms persecution, forms misunderstanding. But even sometimes when our enemies do understand our belief system, they still despise it because it's so demanding. The logic of the love of the Holy Trinity, downloaded through the Incarnation into the Paschal Mystery, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, it's the only logic that holds together all of the law of Christ. Once people figure out that they can't put filters and they can't select, like, this is what I'm going to obey and that is what I like, those other things are sort of like options. Once you figure that out, you're in deep trouble. And so I would say that the Catholic Church and the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, at the end of the day, is here to form saints. But saints ought to work to form civilizations because Catholic civilization makes it easier for more people to become saints. Let's face it, but can God still, you know, the arm of the Lord is not shortened that he cannot save. He can save the Thomas Christians in India who never succeeded in creating a kind of sacramental society like we said we have seen in the West. And so we we can't give in to anger, depression. We can't give in to nostalgia either and just say, oh, if it was only like it was before the council or before the French Revolution or before the Protestant Reformation, you know. We're, we're still in the midst of salvation history, but that means we're still in the midst of spiritual warfare. That reminds me of uh, what Brandon McGinley says in his, his book, Prodigal Church. He talks Love about how book. the 50s are a, a time of great church attendance where the family life is devoid of prayer, is what he right. says. It's like we're just checking out the box. And the seminaries um, were full and the right, convents right. as well, but it was really a kind of cool thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, if there wasn't that sort of inner death... Or, or brittle um, brittleness. What? Why did? Why did it happen? Why did it happen the way that it happened after right. the council? Um, but in, you, what you're really saying, and I, what I like about the book is that you, we are sort of entering into the true Christendom at the Mass. We're entering true. into the heavenly Jerusalem, which is, which is why that can still form saints, even if it's in exile, uh, if we're in a time of that.